Yeah, so the talk on this topic called uh, unambiguous catalytic computation. So suppose you want to perform some computation, but uh, the space available to you for performing that computation is not sufficient. Okay, and let's say in such a case somebody helps you by providing some extra space, but uh, there are two things. First, this extra space is already filled with some content, something arbitrary and something incompressible. And uh, the second thing is that although you are allowed to use this extra space for your computation. Uh, you can write something on this extra space or you can modify the content, but at the end when you are done, you should restore its initial content. Okay. So, in such a case, a uh, question that one can ask is that can we use this extra space somehow to perform the computation that we were not able to perform earlier? And if not, can we prove that this extra space is useless? So, to formally study this question, we have a model called a catalytic Turing machine. So, what is a catalytic Turing machine? It is just like a normal Turing machine, where uh, apart from the input tape and the work tape, you also have this extra tape called auxiliary tape. Okay. And uh, uh, this auxiliary tape initially it can have anything on itself, it need not to be the blank symbols like we usually assume in a Turing machine. And in the middle of the competition, Turing machine can write on this auxiliary tape or read from it, and uh, it is uh, free to do both read and writing there. But uh, when the machine holds, the initial content of the auxiliary tape is back. Okay. So, I guess uh, this explains the name catalytic because uh, the auxiliary tape is supposed to help us uh, or act as like a catalyst acts in a chemical reaction. It helps us in performing our computation and then gets back to its original state. Okay. So, so, the class L uh, denotes the usual log space class, the set of all the languages which are decidable in order log n size free space by a normal Turing machine. Uh, the corresponding class in the catalytic setting is C L. So, it is basically the set of all the languages which are decidable by a catalytic Turing machine uh, with order log n size work space and some poly size auxiliary space. Okay. So, here we have taken the size, uh, here we have taken the size of auxiliary space to be something some n to the c. So, this makes sense because if it is anything more than that, you will not be able to store the address of some cell of the auxiliary tape in your work tape, right. And this is a pretty reasonable thing a Turing machine should be able to do. So, so the question that we asked on the very first slide uh, that extra memory is, is uh, useful or not. Uh, in the log space setting in this model it is equivalent to asking whether L is equal to C L or not. So, intuitively one may feel that uh, the extra memory is useless because, uh, because since you have to restore the information at the end at every point of the computation you should uh, remember it in some form right. And since it is incompressible also, so you are effectively working only with your work space or free space. But the lower bound uh, that we know of class C L uh, indicates that this is probably not true. So, the, uh, the lower bound on the class C L and the upper bound was proved in the same paper in which the this, this model was defined. So, the lower bound is T C 1 and uh, the upper bound is Z P P the set of all the languages which are decidable in expected polynomial time. So, why does this lower bound uh, indicates that L is probably not equal to C L? The reason is again a very long, uh, long standing belief about some other classes. So, T C 1 is known to contain N L non deterministic log space and N L contains L right. So, if now someone proves that L is equal to C L that would imply that L is equal to N L is equal to T C 1 and uh, it is a long standing belief that uh, of, of the community that L is not equal to T C 1. So, this is why we also now believe that uh, L is not equal to T C uh, L is not equal to C L ok. So, this was the deterministic uh, catalytic computation model uh, we also have non deterministic catalytic computation. A non deterministic catalytic uh, Turing machine restores the auxiliary content over all possible sequences of non deterministic choices and the rest of the things remain same. I mean if the input belongs to the language it will be accepted along at least one path, if it is not it will not be accepted along any path. Okay. So, N L is the, uh, the well known class non deterministic log space. Okay. It is catalytic equivalent uh, or I mean the corresponding class in the catalytic setting is C N L the set of languages which are decidable by a non deterministic catalytic Turing machine in order log n size free space and some n to the c size auxiliary space. So, uh, for C N L we know two results we know the upper bound C N L is a subset of Z P P which is the same as uh, the upper bound of C L and uh, we also know that uh, it is closed under complement ok. The emergence shell is an equivalent of the catalytic word. But this holds under an assumption that there is some language in, uh, in uh, linear space n which requires linear exponential size circuits. 
so the reason why we need this as a, uh, this assumption was needed uh, because we need some pseudo random generators to prove that uh, cnl is equal to uh, co cnl and those pseudo random generators exist under this assumption okay so uh, let me just quickly go over the proof of cnl subset zpp uh, proof is short and easy to follow and uh, but more importantly the uh, the observation involved in the proof is crucial not for just cnl subset zpp but also for uh, cnl co cnl and uh, also for what we have proven in our paper okay so the proof goes by the notion of configuration graph okay so in a normal turing machine you have one configuration graph with respect to one machine m and one input x right here it is defined in a slightly different way here you have one configuration graph with respect to one machine m one input x and one auxiliary content one initial auxiliary content a okay and uh, so so uh, let's say g of m x a denotes such a configuration graph with machine with respect to machine m input x and auxiliary content a uh, so a configuration here contains four things it contains the state it contains the head of the, it contains the positions of the head it contains the work tape content and uh, it contains the auxiliary tape content okay so just one more thing so g of m x a contains only those config uh, only those configurations which are reachable from the starting configuration okay uh, unlike in the normal setting you uh, you take all the configurations which are not even reachable here we are only taking those uh, configurations which are reachable from the starting configuration so let's say this is one uh, starting uh, starting configuration and let's take one more uh, starting configuration which is different from it okay so both are the starting configuration for some fixed machine m and fixed input x the only difference is the initial auxiliary content here it is a here it is a prime okay then uh, the claim is that through no sequences of non deterministic choices both of them can land up at the same configuration to see why this is true let's take uh, one competition path starting from this middle configuration to a halting configuration okay and let's look at this particular competition path so this is a competition path uh, from a starting configuration to a halting configuration and since it is a catalytic turing machine uh, which restores its uh, initial auxiliary content so a should be equal to a2 right but at the same time this is also one starting configuration and this is also one competition path so a2 should also be equal to a prime but since i mean it cannot be equal to both a a or a prime simultaneously so something like this cannot happen right so what what this basically says is that uh, two different configuration graphs so uh, so uh, here you can uh, take two configuration graph g of m g of m x and a and uh, g of m x and a prime so what this says is that those two configuration graphs cannot share a common node between them okay the node set are is just is disjoint so this gives us a good upper bound on the uh, on the sum of the size of the configuration graphs over all possible auxiliary contents okay which is just the total number of configurations possible at all okay the 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 number on the right hand side so the first two numbers are basically the uh, number of different work tape content and the number of different auxiliary tape content and the last three numbers are just the head positions for three tapes okay so if you divide on both the sides by 2 to the n to the c what this basically says is that uh, uh, the average size of the configuration graph over all possible auxiliary content is very small it's something uh, just poly of n right even though on a particular in, uh, uh, for a particular auxiliary content a the size of the configuration graph is uh, can be very large something exponential in n yes sir so this uh, this is also very similar to the proof of uh, cl contained in yeah it is yeah yeah it is but doesn't need to change that no no but from the original paper yeah yeah so basically um, yeah they prove uh, cl subset zpp first but uh, but yeah i mean this is not my this was again in the their cnl paper mikal was one of the co-authors yeah. uh, what we know now is that for some particular auxiliary content a the size of the configuration graph can be very large but on average it is very small so in other words if you pick your a randomly auxiliary content randomly then uh, the expected size is some poly of n right and i guess this uh, i mean uh, so uh, now the zpp algorithm for the language of machine m is obvious on some input x you randomly generate a and then you look for the except node in the g of m x and a using some polynomial time search or something okay so this was the non deterministic model uh, in our paper we have studied uh, a special type of non deterministic uh, computation called unambiguous computation so in unambiguous computation uh, your non deterministic algorithm accepts the input 
along exactly one path. Okay. Uh, unlike the non-deterministic model where you accept it along at least one path, uh, here you are accepting it along exactly one path. And if the input does not belong to the language, you will not accept it along any paths. Okay. So, such type of computation or unambiguous computation is uh, well studied in the, in the, uh, with respect to the normal Turing machines. So, class UL is, is, uh, is that class, it is unambiguous log space. So, it is a set of all the languages which are decidable by a, an NL machine with at most one accepting path for every input. Okay. So, we defined this class uh, CUL in the catalytic setting, uh, the corresponding class for UL. And for this, we have proved that uh, CUL is equal to CNL. And this holds under the same assumption as that of CNL equal to co CNL. Right. So, CUL is trivially a subset of CNL, it follows from the definition. To prove that uh, CNL is a subset of CUL, what we do is we construct uh, a CUL machine for a given CNL machine. And this uh, CUL machine finds the, uh, uh, looks for the accept node in the configuration graph of the CNL machine using two techniques. The first is uh, Reinhard Allender's double counting technique, which I will explain briefly in the next two slides. And uh, we also use some of the tools of the CNL equal to co-CNL result. Okay. So, the, the double counting technique was also used uh, for proving the similar result in the traditional setting. So, the same result is also known uh, for NL equal to UL. So, let us, uh, let me just uh, briefly explain what is a uh, double counting technique. So, it is closely associated with uh, with mini unique graphs. Okay. What is a mini unique graph? Uh, a directed graph G is called mini unique with respect to some vertex S. If, uh, uh, if there is a unique shortest path from S to every vertex which is reachable from S. Okay. And uh, there are two application, uh, two well known applications of the double counting technique. The first is that uh, you can construct a UL algorithm for deciding if G is mini unique or not with respect to some vertex S. Okay. And uh, under the promise that G is mini unique with respect to S, you can also decide, you, you can answer, uh, you, uh, you can also answer the decide, uh, you can also answer whether some vertex T is reachable from S or not. Okay. So, let me first define the two parameters that we actually count in this double counting technique. So, for a, uh, for a given graph G and a source node S, let SI denote the set of all the vertices which are uh, uh, which are at distance at most i from s okay. and uh, c i is the first parameter that we will count it is simply the cardinality of the set s i and sigma i is the sum of the distance of all the vertices in s i. So, here by distance I mean the length of the shortest path. Okay. Okay. So, our UL algorithm uh, basically computes these values c i's and sigma i's iteratively starting from c 0 and sigma 0. And, uh, it, it computes the correct value along a unique path and while computing these values it also uh, finds that whether the graph is mini unique with respect to a vertex uh, with respect to the source vertex s, s or not. Okay. So, at the outset we know three things about s 0 right. I mean s 0 is the trivial set which contains only s. So, for this we know three things we know c 0, c 0 is 1, sigma 0 is 0 because uh, the distance from s to s is 0 and we also know that uh, every vertex in S 0 which is S itself has a unique shortest path uh, from S. Okay. So, let us assume the same thing for for S i okay. let us take it uh, let us take it as the base case and uh, and we will see the outline of, of how this UL algorithm computes C i plus 1 and sigma i plus 1 along a unique path. So, what it does is that it first sets C i plus 1 to be C i and sigma i plus 1 to be sigma i. And then it loops over all the vertices of the graph G and checks whether the distance of this vertex u from s is i plus 1 or not. Okay. And it does it by, by generating the vertices of s i along a unique computation path. It can do it along the unique computation path uh, using the three things that we assumed about s i. Okay. Uh, due to the shortage of time we cannot get into the details there, but, uh, but those uh, three things uh, using those three things it can generate the vertices of S i along a unique path. And then what we do is that first we check whether any vertex of S i is equal to u or not. Okay. Because if any of the vertex in S i is equal to u that basically means that uh, the distance is less than equal to i not i plus 1. Okay. And uh, after that you also check uh, if there is some vertex in S i whose neighbor is u. If its neighbor is u then that means the distance is i plus 1. And, uh, and 
if, if there is such neighbor, you increase ci plus 1 appropriately and sigma i plus 1 also. So basically, you increase ci plus 1 by 1 and sigma i plus 1 by i plus 1. Okay, and uh, so uh, uh, once you are done with the values of ci plus 1 and sigma i plus 1, if the graph is mean unique, uh, the property of si that every vertex in si has a unique path from s, the same property will hold true for si plus 1 also, right. So you, uh, uh, you can keep on co computing these uh, c i plus 1 and sigma i plus 1 till c n and sigma n, where n is the number of vertices. And in the end, you, get, you just say yes, because the graph is mini unique. But what if the graph is not mini unique? So in that case, there will be some vertex, uh, which will be having two minimum, uh, two minimum, uh, two shortest paths from s, right. And so let us take, uh, uh, let us take a vertex, which is nearest to the source s, okay. And uh, I mean, uh, the nearest vertex to s, which has more than one shortest path, okay. And let us say its distance is i plus 1. So, when you are computing c i plus 1 and sigma i plus 1, what you will find is that there will be two edges for such a vertex u, okay, Fro from two different nodes of the SI. So, if this is the case, you can just halt and reject the instance at that time. Okay. So, this was for uh, deciding whether the, uh, whether the graph is min unique with respect to s or not. Under the promise that graph is min unique, what you, uh, you can solve the reachability also. So, it is not hard to see that if graph is min unique, you will be uh, computing all the c i's and sigma i's properly and uh, you are bound to see all the vertices which are reachable from s. Right? So, you can set a flag somewhere and if, if you uh, see the node that you are looking for, you can set it to true and when you are done with the c i's and sigma i, you can just output that flag. So, which is what we do in the CUL algorithm of the CNL configuration graph. So, so, yeah, so const uh, what we are doing here is that for a given CNL machine M, we are constructing a CUL machine M prime such that both of them have the same language, okay. And here is a basic working of this, uh, this machine M prime, the CUL machine M prime on input X and auxiliary content A. It treats A as the auxiliary content of M, okay. And then it performs a double counting technique on the G of M, X and A with initial configuration as the source. And uh, while performing the double counting technique, it looks for the accept node, because if it is reachable, you will find it somewhere. And based on that, it uh, accepts the input x or not. Okay. But this is not correct. Uh, there are three issues with this. First issue is that you do not have the space to store ci and sigma i, right? Because on a particular a, the size of the configuration graph can be very large, something exponential in n. So for storing ci, you, you may need n bits. And in, since in CUL machine, you only have some order log n size free space. You do not know any good way to store the CIs in auxiliary space okay. without losing its content. So, so this is one problem that you cannot store CI and sigma i if the configuration graph size is very large. The second problem is that it may not be min unique. Right. You, have, uh, you should work with a graph which is min unique. And the third problem is uh, that M prime cannot loop over all configurations of M. So, this is required if you remember that uh, while performing the double counting technique, you have to loop over all the nodes and check whether their distance is i plus 1 or not. So, here the CL machine also needs to do the same thing, but it is not able to do. It can do it, but it will lose its initial auxiliary content. There is no good way of looping over all the auxiliary, uh, uh, looping over all the configurations of M. So, yeah. so the problem, uh, the solution to the problem 1 and 2 is uh, very similar. So, first thing we know is that even though for a particular A, the graph size can be very large, the expected configuration graph size is, is small, okay. And uh, second thing uh, about uh, creating a mini unique graph that we know is that, uh, which is a simple application of isolation lemma, that if you randomly assign uh, some poly size weights to a directed graph, with very high probability it makes it mini unique, okay. So, under the mentioned assumption, we have uh, two pseudo random generators, which help us in create, in, in making a in, in creating a, a small size configuration graph and uh, a weight function also which makes that configuration graph min unique. Okay. So, specifically we will be working with uh, these two pseudo random generators f and w which are log space computable and uh, so, uh, for f and w we know that there exists some seed s and s prime such that it makes uh, uh, such that for s uh, g of m x a is or of f s is a small size and the same graph is min unique with respect to the weight function w of s prime. Okay. And uh, the solution to the third problem is, 
is using a hash function which maps the large size nodes. So, uh, since the uh, size of a node of a configuration graph is some n to the c, okay, and you cannot loop over all those nodes. So, what you want is uh, some hash function which can map those large size nodes to some small, small size nodes. Okay. So, uh, for that we do not have a single function, but what we have is a hash family. Uh, where we know that at least one hash function out of that uh, hash family has this desired property that it will map the large size node of a small size configuration graph to small size nodes. Okay. So, with this, so this is the okay. So, I will be presenting now the final outline of the algorithm. So, m prime on input x and auxiliary content w, uh, it, uh, it create all the tuples using all the seeds of s, uh, all the seeds of f all the seeds of w and uh, all the functions of h okay so one for one particular uh, uh, one particular s one particular s prime and one particular hk instead of working with g of m x a it works with hashed weighted graph g of m x a is or f s with respect to the weight function w s and uh, hash function h k with initial configuration as the source okay you perform the double counting on in the on this hashed weighted graph and uh, while performing the double counting you also detect whether this tuple is bad or not. So, by a bad tuple I mean that with, uh, if a tuple is bad then that means that either s is not creating a small size configuration graph or s prime is not giving you a mean unique weight function or h k is not injectively mapping uh, the nodes of the configuration graph on smaller values. Okay. So, if it, it detects whether the tuple is bad or not while performing the double counting and it moves to the next tuple. And if it is a good uh, tuple then you just finish computing c i's and sigma i's and at the end you accept or reject the input based on whether you saw the accept node or not while performing the double counting. Okay. So, all this requires uh, 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 some minor fixes and minor modifications uh, to the actual double counting technique which we do on the actual graph rather than the hash graph. So, I cannot cover all of them obviously, but uh, let me just uh, present a, uh, one major obstacle that we faced. So, let us assume that everything goes well till the ith level. Okay. So, by, as, by, uh, by that I mean that all the vertices in S i have a unique shortest path from initial configuration okay. and uh, your hash function h maps every vertex S i injectively to these smaller values. Okay. So, here we compute C i and uh, C i plus 1 and sigma i plus 1 uh, and sigma i plus 1 in a slightly different way. Instead of uh, uh, instead of going over all the nodes and checking whether it is at distance i plus 1 or not, what we do here is that we go over all the hashed values and uh, and we check whether there is a dist uh, there is a node at distance i plus 1 which hashes to v or not. Okay. So, for this we can do a simple test that uh, on all the vertices of S i we will we'll generate it in a uh, along a unique uh, computation path like we did for the double counting technique. And, uh, after and uh, while we are generating these vertices of S i, we will check whether uh, we will check that none of the vertices of S i hashes to V. And if there is a neighbor of one of the vertex of S i which uh, hashes to V, then we inc increment the C i plus 1 and uh, sigma i plus 1 appropriately. So, this is a fine case. The problem occurs when something like this happens. So, uh, there is a node in S i which hashes to V and uh, there is also a node in S i whose neighbor hashes to v. So, here we do not know whether v 1 is equal to v 2 is, is equal to u or not or uh, I mean. So, it, it, it could be that v 1 is equal to u okay, which is fine uh, in that case we just move to the next hash value and check for it, but in case if v 1 is not equal to u then that means that you are facing a bad hash function which is not injectively mapping the nodes of the vertices. Okay. So, to find this uh, you cannot simply. So, uh, let us say you at this point you realize that uh, you have some node which is hashing to v and you know that okay, there was one node earlier which was also hashing to v, but due to the way that we are generating these vertices it is not simply possible to go back and compare these nodes to see that whether they are equal or not. Okay. So, instead of instead of that what we what we, uh, we will do is that we will do this procedure again and again. Okay. So, we just store that okay, this is the first vertex. Okay and uh, this is and uh, there is a neighbor of the second vertex which we need to compare. So, uh, we run this procedure again and uh, while running this procedure you store the first bit of this node and first bit of this node and at the end of the procedure you just compare whether these two bits are equal or not. Okay. If they are not equal then that means that uh, these nodes are not equal 
and basically you are facing a bad hash function, so you move to the next tuple. If they are equal, then you do the same procedure for the second bits, and you, you keep on do it until you finish all the bits. And at the end, you will know whether these nodes were actually equal or not. Uh, and if they were not equal, you move to the next tuple. And that's so this was one way of uh, of uh, detecting a bad hash function. We had we had to detect uh, whether the graph is min unique or not. That was uh, other hurdle. And uh, apart from that, we also ha uh, had to see that uh, the concession graph size is small or not. So yeah. So this was all. Thank you. Uh, like on, on this U and a CUL is close on the component actually? Yeah, it is, it is. is so, it yeah, it is. So, I, I think the only thing you need to do is that, uh, right, uh, you, you, fi you know that whether accept node is present or not along a unique path, right. So, at the end, you can just flip your answer and that would uh, result in, the, I mean, that would be the proof that CUL is equal to uh, cos CUL. I mean, probably I'm not clear, but this is true. I mean, because I mean, this was uh, I mean advised by one of the anonymous reviewer also, and we also checked. But uh, yeah, but we can yeah. The simulation you uh, needs these uh, generators, so that comes from the assumption that. Yeah, it comes under the assumption. And that's exactly the same assumption that is used for complementing C and Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there any possibility that you may be able to do this simulation with a slightly weaker assumption? Yeah, there is. So, so here what we need is that we need just one seed for which the concentration graph size is small, right. You need just one seed. In case of CNL, co-CNL, you need at least half many seeds, right. So, I do not know, I mean for that I guess we have to look at the those pseudo random generator result, if we can weaken the assumption there. But yeah, I mean we thought about it, that here all we need is just one seed. Thank you.